Okay. Hmm? Oh, it's bad for the... Uh, well, I think the cameraman objects. I make it... Yeah. If you open shape, your TV presence is not Well, I, my TV presence is non-existent to begin with, so I better not endanger it further. Okay. <laughs> However, enough of this persiflage. I see my announcement that we were going to compute the magnetic moment today had a serious effect on the attendance. <laughs> what? <laughs> I won't get to it in the second half of the lecture, though. Uh, questions? Kay. Um, when the pen works, um, when the first pen works, mm -hmm. you know this pen is the case of ATP. Mm -hmm. Does ATP have one and then two? What, the final result is independent. The, the amount in which you have to weight the two things is, of course, uh, uh, depends, uh, depends on M1 and M2. The amount in which you, you weight each of the two masses, each of the two subtraction terms, in the Polyvialar's method depends on the masses you're subtracting because you want to cancel both the quadratic and the logarithmic divergence. That means the sum of the two subtraction co coefficients has to, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. The sum of the two subtraction constants coefficients has to be one yeah. and uh, well the point is this, you have an integrand Okay, that depends on, uh, how should I put it? it? It goes like 1 over k squared, and then there's uh, m squared over k squared, m squared over k fourth, where m is the, uh, uh, is the mass of the fermion running around the loop. Mm -hmm. So uh, You've got to arrange matters, so this gives you the quadratic divergence, and this gives you the logarithmic divergence, okay? When you integrate d4k. Mm -hmm. okay. So you've got to arrange matters, so if you call the two coefficients c1 and c2 to cancel the quadratic divergence, 1 plus c1 plus c2 equals 0. c1 and c2 are two negative numbers, okay? Well, I don't understand why that works. Um, now we're subtracting from the whole loops. Yeah. But it's the yeah. same thing. It's an integrand. It's an integrand. After you do all the shiftings and so on, you have a single loop integral of this structure. If you choose your two subtractions so that this is true, the 1 over k squared term cancels. This is the contribution from the fermion, original fermion. This is the contribution from the <coughs> two regulator loops. Mm -hmm. And then if you choose m squared plus c1 m squared, I mm -hmm. guess, the contribution from the 1 over k squared term will cancel. At 1 over k fourth, and then you'll get a finite result, although, of course, cutoff dependent, depending on the masses m1 squared and m2 squared. Uh -huh. Also, when you do that problem, do you have to use the three Yeah, sure. There's only one of them. The only counter term that comes in is the f mu nu squared counter term, but it's there. Uh -huh. Otherwise, the result wouldn't be independent of the cutoff if the cutoff went to infinity. Well, he got the right answer for except for the counter term. <coughs> oh, sure, because the counter the counter term is also of that form, so that's true before or after you put in the counter term. Yeah, to get it to demonstrate that it is cut off independence as the limit when the limit went. You choose the counter term L of BPH to cancel the terms in the power series expansion of the thing of the point k equals zero. Oh, I see. So in this case, it's to cancel the k equals zero part of that graph. No, so the k equals zero part is strictly zero. It's the second art as a consequence of gauge invariance. It's the coefficient of k squared g mu nu minus k mu nu k square. Sorry, k squared g mu nu minus k mu k nu, which is in the BPH sense a second order term. That is canceled by f mu nu squared, which generates the same sort of, of thing with a constant coefficient. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Other questions? I see the home of the rubber ducky is here, but... <laughs>
<laughs> he seems to have dropped out of the course. Mm -hmm. I know, he seemed around middling for our graduate students. <laughs> We've gotten degrees for worse. So anyway. <laughs> the uh, this lecture, I'm going to discuss a sequence of problems involving the interactions of um, quantum electrodynamics with, a quant with an external charge distribution. <laughs> JMU is a given C number charge distribution. And for simplicity and also for realism, I will restrict myself to the case mu squared equals zero. That is to say, the real photon, which as far as we know, has no mass or a negligible mass. Uh, problems involving <coughs> a quantum electrodynamic subjected to an external charge distribution are, of course, uh, quite common, not realistically, uh, because uh, there are no uh, external char classical charges in the world, as far as we know, controlled by God, not by the motion of particles. But in a typical problem, which you have an electron whirling around the synchrotron, it's quite reasonable to take the distribution of currents inside the synchrotron magnets as external and given, and not worry about solving for the motions of all those electrons. Uh, the first thing I want to check is the amplitude, the vacuum to vacuum amplitude to second order in J squared. Uh, the reason I want to do that, that's, very, so that's an experiment, for example, in which we take two of these external charge distributions or current distributions and see what the interaction energy is between them. I want to do that to check that we've normalized everything right, and E is really the E measured by Mr. Coulomb, Monsieur Coulomb, in his famous experiment. <laughs> <laughs> the vacuum to vacuum amplitude to order J squared, I'm assuming the charges are weak and that's the leading order, is of course very simple. The current makes a, uh, a photon. The photon goes on electron-positron pairs or whatever and then comes back again reassembling the propagator. The heavy dot is the interaction with the external current. I'll introduce, as always, a bit of notation. I'll call this thing, it's of course got an energy momentum conserving delta function. If both momenta are directed inward, and then there is a function, which I'll call d mu nu prime of k, the renormalized photon propagator. By our renormalization conditions, BPH renormalization and mass shell renormalization agree if the photon is massless. So whichever set you use, uh, d mu nu prime of k is minus i k mu nu minus k mu k nu over k squared over k squared. I'll systematically suppress i epsilons from the one photon intermediate state and our normalization is such that the residue at the photon pole is one. Then we would expect a la Lehmann spectral representation for there to be a continuous integral following form coming from the contributions when we put in a complete sum of intermediate states of uh, electron positron, three photons, 17 electrons, 17 positrons, and 27 photons, etc. <laughs> and then finally there will be k mu k nu over k squared terms which we know will suffer no radiative corrections but they will be gauge dependent. I didn't derive, in case you thought you might have missed a lecture, the spectral representation for a vector for the photon, but it's obviously exactly the same sequence of tricks as we went, manipulations that we went through for the scalar case. 
with just a couple of extra indices floating around. The, um, to, uh, I will also, of course, define the Fourier transform of the um, external current distribution. J mu twiddle of, of uh, well, better to do it this way. J mu of x equals integral d four k over two pi to the fourth, even minus i k dot x. J mu twiddle of k. I've got to be careful about my signs because later on I'll be doing a more complicated problem, which I'll have terms linear and k around. So uh, note that I have arranged the sign so that the amplitude for emitting a photon, if I were to go to the lowest order process, the emission of a single photon of momentum k would be j mu twiddle of k, and the amplitude for absorbing a photon would be j mu twiddle of minus k. Now, the graph in question is, of course, trivial to compute. There is a minus IE squared from the E explicitly in the interaction. There is a combinatoric factor of 1 over 2. There is an integral d4k. There is a j mu twiddle of k. There is a d mu nu prime of k. And finally, there is a j mu twiddle of minus k. <coughs> the um, over 2 pi 4, oh, I left out the 2 pi 4. Or, assembling these things together, i e squared over 2, integral d 4 k, 2 pi to the 4th. Something I should have said earlier, of course, my external current distribution is not totally free. I'm assuming it is conserved in which case I can ignore all the terms associated with j mu and, um, and um, associated with k mu and k nu of k um, of minus k just from the g mu nu's. Um, 1 over k squared plus integral 0 to infinity, rho of a squared, d a squared, 1 over k squared minus a squared. Now, the significant feature is that um, the coefficient of the 1 over k squared term, which of course, as we know from uh, the studies of one photon exchange, gives a Coulomb force the standard Coulomb force, if these are static charge distributions, is 1, just as it would be in the free theory. So the force between these uh, distant, uh, between, uh, F, sorry, and this is, of course, a continuous superposition of Yukawa's. Of Yukawa potentials, smoothed out. So if we take two charges, external charges, at a large distance from each other so that the Yukawas are annihilated, they fall off with distance, the surviving term, the term that falls off least rapidly, is the Coulomb force. And we have reproduced in a blackboard and chalk version of M. Coulomb's experiment, where he measures the force between two charges widely separated, at least by the standards of wide separation on an atomic level, very widely separated and discovers the force between them is e squared over r squared. And it is e squared, so we have scaled everything properly. This is, I have not fooled you by some notational fluke, this is indeed the proper way to couple in an external current distribution if e is to be what Mr. Coulomb measured. Yes? Well, because it goes all the way down to zero, you mean. Well, it's also a continuous integral, though. It doesn't have a, you know, it's, 
So uh, you might be, you might get a, uh, if you study such integrals, you discover that uh, uh, you might get uh, a force that uh, go, at worst, that goes down like some power of one over, faster than one over r squared, perhaps not exponentially faster, but like one over r cubed or one over r fourth or something like that. Okay. But it'll certainly go faster than, uh, faster than this term. It certainly doesn't have a pole in it. Okay. It may have a square root singularity of some kind or something like that, but it's certainly going to be less singular than the delta function. When you expect that in lowest value of A to matter to be the mass of the lightest uh, charged particle in the theory? No, because one photon can go into three photons. Oh. So you could have a three photon intermediate state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it has to do that by a charged particle, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, that doesn't matter. The a squared is the mass of the intermediate state that comes into the sum of intermediate states. The fact that the transition matrix element from vacuum to that state of a mu uh, involves graphs with internal uh, electron lines is not the point. Oh, okay. Okay. It's the mass of the three photon state, which is zero. I don't know how that three, by the way, I don't know how that three photon state uh, contributes, whether it indeed gives us one over r fifth or one over r to the tenth or, or something. Can you also have a two photon state? No, charge conjugation. Photon is odd under charge conjugation, so uh, uh, electric, amu acting on the vacuum produces an odd charge conjugation state, which cannot be two photons. Okay, is everyone happy? I'm not quite sure I see what, why this is the an Well, in an earlier lecture, last semester, I did, the, uh, I did two particles exchange, two spinless particles exchanging a spinless particle. And I showed that 1 over k squared minus a squared corresponded to a Yukawa force. And 1 over, uh, and of course, when a went to 0, a 1 over k squared minus mu squared corresponded to a potential e to the minus mu r over r. And um, 1 over k squared corresponded to a Coulomb potential. So that's why this is a Coulomb potential. By the way, the sign is different from scalar exchange. And that's right. Scalar exchange is attractive, is a, um, attractive between identical sources. And the, we know the Coulomb force is supposed to be repulsive between identical sources. The sign is different because everything is the same except for the residue of the pole of the propagator, which has a minus sign in it. Is that your question? Or? Um, I, I mean, you take two classical charge distributions, large macroscopic objects, which you idealize as being classical external charges. Put one of them here, one of them there, OK? And measure in the limit of weak charges, so you don't have to worry about nonlinear effects, that is to say, only to order j squared, the force between them. This yeah, because it's the, ground, it's the ground state, the vacuum graphs are the, gr for a time independent external source, the sum of the vacuum graphs is, re is uh, related to the uh, energy shift of the ground state of the theory. That was, again, an earlier lecture. And uh, if you want, come talk to me privately, and I'll give you a short derivation of that. And therefore, we're determining how the ground state, the energy, the ground state energy is changed by the presence of these external charge distributions, i.e., the force between the charge distributions. Okay, it's exactly like you make a molecular force in uh, an inter uh, internuclear force in molecular theory by uh, measuring the ground state energy of the electron system with fixed nuclear positions. Here, the analog of the electron system is the entire quantum electrodynamical vacuum state. OK? Well, <clears throat> that was fairly straightforward. Now let's turn to something more complicated. The scattering, once now that we've normalized our current distribution and made sure we've normalized it right, let's consider our. Um, current distribution in, um, here it is again, scattering an electron only once. Again, it's a weak external current distribution, so we'll go to first order in it. That is to say, here's our external current distribution. 
it does what it will. An electron comes in, and an electron goes out. The initial electron is labeled by a Dirac spinner U and a four momentum P, and the final electron by a Dirac spinner U prime and a four momentum P prime. Momentum K is being transferred this way, so P plus K equals P prime, as conventionally. Uh, well, it's labeled by U prime, a U bar, of course, will appear in the, in the matrix element. The um, matrix element I will define to be Ia, as always, for the scattering process. I will put together all the i's and minus signs from the propagator and the e that comes from the interaction of the external charge distribution and write this as Ie j mu twiddle of k. That's the right sign because I arranged the convention right after doing it wrong four times last night. <laughs> A function I'll call f mu, about which I will say more later. F mu has got a U bar prime and a U in it and some Dirac matrices and some functions of momentum. F mu has been chosen so that to lowest order, it's U bar prime gamma mu U times E plus, whoops, that should be an upper mu, plus corrections which are of course of order E cubed. They come from adding a photon loop somewhere down at the bottom vertex. That's how I've scaled my thing. How about the photon propagator? Hmm? Uh, whoops, I'm sorry. You're right, I left something out. I'll just take out the 1 over k squared part, the photon pole. Now, f mu will be uh, uh, some spinners times some functions of k squared, and let's try and count the uh, number of invariants there can be, and then try and construct them. The easiest way to study the process, as usual in this counting invariance game, is to go into the cross channel to read the diagram straight down and consider the process photon off the mass shell. actually a current, of course, makes an E plus, E minus pair. And then we can just use standard angular momentum arguments to compute how many things there are. So we have a current making an E plus, E minus pair. The current is conserved, so in the rest center of mass frame of uh, the vector k, which is now considered to be timelike in this process, it, is, uh, it has the same properties as a 1 minus particle. Spin 1, that is to say, the space, a spatial vector, spin 1 and parity minus. We wish to build a 1 minus state out of an electron and a positron. Since electron and positron are particle and antiparticle and fermions, they have opposite intrinsic parities, and therefore 1 minus state must be have even L to be 1 minus. So there are two possibilities, L equals 0, S equals 1, and L equals 2, S equals 1. Those can both be put together to make a unique way to make total angular momentum 1 and have parity minus. Charge conjugation is also a restriction, but it happens to give us no further restriction among these things. The uh, current, of course, makes charge conjugation odd states, but since, again, these are Fermi, fermion and anti-fermion, both the L equals 0, S equals 1, and L equals 2, S equals 1 states are symmetric in both space and spin, and therefore odd under charge conjugation. Therefore, there are no more than two invariant functions of k squared required to describe this. There are only two, and at least two, invariant functions of k squared required to describe this process. The invariant functions, which when we continue to time like k, 
would represent the amplitude for making the L equals zero state and the amplitude for making the L equals two state. And with that knowledge, I will now write down two functions that obviously satisfy all the restraints of parity, charge, conjugation, etc. And that will be the end of the story. F mu, not the end, the beginning. F mu equals E u bar prime gamma mu u. That's uh, certainly a, whoops, guess I'll lower it. That's certainly a possibility, except of course it can be multiplied by some function of k squared, which I'll call f1. And then there's another term, which I will choose with great care to look at my notes to make sure I get all the signs right, because it involves a sigma matrix, and therefore your horrible minus sign errors are possible. I, why that I is there, you will see in a moment if you're patient. E over 2m, why that funny factor is there, you will also see in a moment. U bar, sigma mu nu, k nu, u, f2 of k squared. Um, these are in two invariants, obviously independent, and obviously um, um, having being perfectly consistent with all the constraints of parity, charge conjugation, Lorentz transformations, etc. Both sigma mu nu and gamma mu are charge conjugation odd. Both of these objects are vector, etc. F1 and F2 which completely characterize this problem are called respectively the Dirac form factor. Every, this is a subject where things have distinguished names and the poly form factor. Why they're called form factors I'll talk about in a moment. You may still be puzzled by my motivation for my notational convention, all those I's and K's I took care to put it in the right place, but um, you uh, should be uh, happy when I have shown that this, is, this completely characterizes the matrix element. I should say I normalize sigma mu nu L of Bjork, Kane, and Drell. Sigma mu nu is I over 2 gamma mu gamma nu. We have one piece of information from our uh, normalization conventions, from our renormalization conventions, and that is that um, F1 of 0 equals 1. Otherwise, that tells us that's the condition on the renormalization of the electric charge. Otherwise, that E is, in fact, this IPI function at, uh, at k squared equals 0. Otherwise, we know nothing about F1 at any other value of k squared, except, of course, the lowest order in E. And uh, we know nothing about F2 at all at any point without doing computational labor. <coughs> I should point out that this analysis is uh, not special to the electron. It is special to a spin one-half particle, but it could be absolutely any spin one-half particle I was talking about down here. Could, for, be, for example, be a particle like a proton, in which case there would be all sorts of strong interactions inside this one particle irreducible graph. This is, in fact, of tremendous usefulness in analyzing the, uh, this is a side remark, but it's a, such an important physical point that I feel no shame about wasting a minute on it. The fact that we can analyze this sort of process in terms of these two functions of k squared, f1 and f2, means that if we consider, for example, <coughs> electron-proton scattering to order E squared in amplitude. Then the only, the proton has all sorts of strong interactions, but all the electron interacts with is electromagnetism and the weak interactions. The weak interactions are bookkiss. So what happens is that <coughs> this makes a photon and to order e squared, that's all that can happen. Order e, that can all that can happen. And then there's some blob down here, which sums up all the effects of the strong interactions. 
for the proton, and then we've soaked up both of our E's. This blob is uh, unknown, unless you can solve the strong interaction problem, in which case, what are you doing sitting in this class? <laughs> but <laughs> one thing we know about it is that it's the same blob that appears in this process, and therefore it is given completely in terms of F1 and F2 for the proton. We may not know what those functions are until we can solve the strong interaction problem, but we know there are just two of them. Therefore, we have a great simplification in studying electron-proton scattering. In principle, because although we don't understand the strong interactions, we understand quantum electrodynamics, in principle, the scattering amplitude would be a bunch of spinner invariants times arbitrary functions of two variables, say the energy and the angle. We have turned it into a known um, functions involving just two unknown functions of a single variable, f1 and f2, and that is progress no matter how you slice it. Any questions on this point? We can also turn this thing on its head and say by doing electron-proton scattering, we get information on f1 and f2, and therefore perhaps learn something about these strong interactions, because they're what make f1 and f2 for the proton what it is. So uh, it's good, good both ways. We can either say we can, we've reduced our ignorance of electron-proton scattering, even in the absence of being able to solve the strong interaction problem, or we can say we can use um, electrons as a probe to investigate the strong interaction structure of the proton in a very simple situation where upon looking at the structure of nuclei, for example, is a rather complicated situation with 42 protons interacting with each other. <coughs> Now, I would like now to return. Are there any questions about this point? Hmm? Here? Uh, a mu is charge conjugation odd because it couples to psi bar gamma mu psi, which is charge conjugation odd. So this off shell current, A mu, must produce a uh, charge conjugation odd state. For fermion and anti fermion, charge conjugation odd states are those that are totally, anti -sym totally symmetric. These are symmetric in space and symmetric in spin, and therefore C odd. Okay. C, C gives us no further restraints. <clears throat> I would now like to return to uh, the interpretation of the form factors after I've explained their utility. And um, to um, do that, I'd like to remind you and explain why we only factored out the k squared in this formula to define f mu. Let's suppose we were to analyze the classical Maxwell equations for. Um, for uh, this given current distribution, j mu. Then in Lorentz gauge, for example, I would have to solve the equation del squared a mu classical. That's got nothing to do with any a mu in our real field theoretic problem. It's just the classical solution is e j mu, which, of course, is readily solved in Fourier space. A mu classical twiddle is minus 1 over k squared j mu twiddle. Likewise, the classical electromagnetic field associated with this classical potential is given by this expression, which in Fourier space equals um, F mu nu classical twiddle equals, let's see, differentiation is minus I k. So I get minus i k mu a mu twiddle minus k mu a nu twiddle. Uh, this enables us to give a different me uh, new meaning to our interaction amplitude here. I a equals minus i, out in front, a mu twiddle classical, e 
U bar prime gamma mu u, F1 of k squared, plus minus E over 4m, U bar prime sigma mu nu, U, F mu nu twiddle classical, F2 of k squared. The second term arises because only the anti-symmetric part of Ka comes in the, uh, because it's multiplied by sigma mu nu, an anti-symmetric matrix. So I've just written down the anti-symmetric part of Ka, which is 1 half f mu nu. Now, we thus get a little better idea of the uh, meaning of the two form factors. The first term, the Dirac form factor, is exactly the same interaction with the classical field made by this classical source as would be produced if uh, you had a fundamental coupling, E bar, psi bar, E psi bar, gamma mu psi, A mu. It differs from this in that it has a k-squared dependence. It's not a constant, which is the sign of a point coupling, in Fourier, a, Fourier, a constant in Fourier space, the delta function in x space. It's not a constant, which would be true case if it were a point coupling. It has some chord of k-squared dependence. So we can say the effects of the interactions of the electron with the quantum electrodynamic field, or the effects of the proton with uh, the strong interactions, is to uh, keep this from being a constant to sort of spread out in a relativistically invariant way the interaction of the electron with the, uh, with the field. And that is why this is called a form factor tells you the form of the electron, the way in which this interaction is spread out. This term, the second term, the poly form factor, is an interaction of a new type, a sort of spin-dependent interaction, the kind of interaction that would arise if we had a term in our interaction. That's why I put the I in, by the way. I shouldn't put a prime here. If we had this sort of interaction added to the Lagrangian, that sort of interaction is perfectly gauge invariant and consistent with charge conjugation. It's non-minimal. And it would make something of this sort with a point F2, with F2 being a constant. Of course, um, it can't be there as a fundamental interaction because it's non-renormalizable. It's of dimension 5, as any child can see. But it is. It is, uh, can nevertheless, the effects that would be made by such an interaction can arise, not as a point coupling, but in a spread out way, as a result of the quantum electrodynamic corrections that make F2. Now we can go even further. This is just manipulation to make words, OK? If all you want to know is this. This is the only hard thing I've told you. I mean, the only hard fact. I'm just playing with these objects over and over again to try and give you some idea of their physical meaning. We can go further. By exploiting an amusing identity, which I believe is due to Pasquale Jordan, if I'm not sure. starts off by doing something very stupid. I'm going to complicate this expression. It's the rack matrix manipulation. It's already as simple as it can be. I'm going to make it look complicated. My first step in my grand scheme of making it look complicated is to write it in this way. U bar prime, p slash prime, gamma mu, plus gamma mu, p slash. You, you may think I'm crazy to do that, but it's certainly true. P slash on U is M. P prime slash on U bar prime is M. No, I go even further and write, for example, gamma mu P slash as 1 half the anti-commutator of gamma mu P slash plus 1 half the commutator of gamma mu P slash. 
The first term is P mu by the Dirac algebra. The second term, by the definition of the sigmas, is minus I sigma mu nu P nu. There's the definition of the sigmas down there. That's just what I've done, dotting P nu into that equation. Now, the uh, likewise P prime slash gamma mu is P prime mu. And now the commutator is in the other order. So I get plus I sigma mu nu P prime nu. Now, I add all of this up, and I find u bar prime gamma mu u equals u bar prime u p mu plus p prime mu plus i over 2m sigma mu nu p prime minus p, which is k. Gordon, I'm sorry, I thought it was Jordan. It's Gordon? Okay, it's so Gordon. Okay, it's Oscar. Os oh, okay. Okay, sorry, I take it back. It's Gordon. Uh, what did I do that was wrong? Oh, oh, oh 2M, yeah, right. Thank you. Oh, yes. Boy, I'm in bad shape. Gordon, Jordan, you bar juice. When I get to the computation, it'll be a real mess. <laughs> okay. Now, this, um, this decomposition, of course, has uh, amusing consequences for the, um, for, and gives us further insight into the physical meaning of the, um, form factors, because I can now write the amplitude using the expression on the left-hand board and put it plugging in the Gordon decomposition. I script A, the transition amplitude, is minus I a twiddle, mu classical, I see I left out the 2m in my notes also, e, f1 of k squared, I'll stick it in right now so I won't forget it any more, u bar prime p mu plus p mu prime u, <coughs> minus e over 4m, u bar prime, sigma mu nu, k nu, u, times the quantity, f1 of k squared, from applying this decomposition to the first term, plus f2 of k squared, which was always there altogether. Now, and f mu nu, sorry, f mu nu twiddle classical, forgive me. Oh, there, that's the right formula. Now, I'm sorry, I wrote it slovenly, and now I pay the penalty because nobody understands what I wrote. Now we get a rather interesting interpretation. This is, after all, p mu plus p mu prime would be the coupling of a spinless particle to an external electric field in lowest order. That's just the current of a spinless particle, psi star d mu psi, anti-symmetrized. As you know, if you did the homework problems involving spinless particles. So this is like a spin-independent coupling, at least as close to a spin-independent coupling as a relativistic spin one-half particle can get, u bar u with no gamma matrices inside. So this is rather like, with big quotes, because of course u bar u is full of spin factors if you go to the highly relativistic limit, spin-independent 
And this thing with the big fat sigma mu nu inside is spin dependent. Spin independent and spin dependent means spin independent and spin dependent in the relativistic, non relativistic limit, of course. Yes? No, because it's, you, you're summing twice sigma mu nu with f mu nu twiddle. I stayed up until 6 o'clock this morning getting all my signs right, believe me. <laughs> OK. Now, let's go immediately to the non relativistic limit and get the meaning of the spin dependent coupling. Now, if I can disentangle this, the non relativistic limit features a strangulation of the professor. <laughs> U is a two-component spinner U, capital U, times something I'll approximate as zero. I'll normalize my states non-relativistically, so U adjoint U equals 1. I won't put a 2M in because I'd have to take that 2M out again when I go to the non-relativistic normalization of states. F K squared, of course, I approximate as zero, so F1 of K squared I approximate by 1. And f2 of k squared, I approximate by its value at 0, which I don't know, f2 of 0. In the non-relativistic limit, for spinners at rest, u prime adjoint sigma 0i u equals 0. Sigma 0i, Lorentz generators, are pure off-diagonal. They mix up large components and small components. <clears throat> Sorry, this should not have been capitalized. On the other hand, u prime adjoint sigma ij u is simply the poly spin matrices, sigma k, capital U, times epsilon ijk to turn a vector into an anti-symmetric tensor. This you will also all find in the back pages of Bjorkane and Drell if you're worried about my sign conventions. I was worried, and I went to the back pages of Bjorkane and Drell. <laughs> <laughs> also in the back pages of Bjorkane and Drell, I discovered for the electromagnetic field, and I trust them, Fij is epsilon ijk I put the sigma upper k, of course. Bk, where B is the standard magnetic field of Maxwell. We can thus very easily study this term here, the spin-dependent term, in the non-relativistic limit. The only terms that contribute are where mu and nu and i and j, and when f is i and j. We get a factor of 2 because we sum over each thing twice, once in this role as ij and once in this role as ji. Other than that, spin dependent term equals. Uh, Hmm? OK. OK, I may have made a mistake at the next one. <laughs> Let's see. There's a minus i here and a minus sign here, so that's plus i. I'm counting each thing twice, so I get e over 2m. I have 1 plus f2 of 0 as the factor in front. And then I have capital U prime adjoint sigma dot B capital U. Now, you may remember that in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, the analog of what we called IA is the matrix element between the final state and the initial state of minus i h prime. That's just our good old Dyson formula. 
Okay. Therefore, the effective non-relativistic coupling is taking out the minus sign and the i. It comes out real. That's why I put the i in to begin with. Is minus e over 2m, 1 plus f2 of 0, sigma dot b. Is everybody happy? You may remember the definition of the magnetic moment operator is that the magnetic coupling to an external magnetic field is minus mu times sigma over 2, the spin operator. That's the magnetic moment, the spin operator, dot b. That's the definition of the magnetic moment of the electron. Comparing terms, we see mu is e over m, 1 plus f2 of 0. Everybody happy? This is called the Dirac moment. It is an excellent approximation to the magnetic moment of the electron and is the result you find in all non-relativistic quantum mechanics books where they say where this number comes from will be explained in non-relativistic quantum, in, in relativistic quantum mechanics. Now you have seen where it comes from. Of course, for the electron, there is a small correction because F2 is non-zero and begins order E cubed. So there will be correction of order E cubed from this, the anomalous moment which I will shortly calculate, filling up the rest of the lecture. Okay, but the majority of the lecture was explaining the universe thing, because anyone can compute Feynman graphs as figuring out what things mean. <laughs> but, uh, or use other methods. But none of the other methods have so far cracked the moment problem. Uh. We can connect moments. We can connect the moment of the lambda to the moment of the neutron, for example, and I will next week. <laughs> the, um, but we can't compute any, any of them from first principles. Okay, that's the situation. Therefore, our task is to compute to order E cubed F2 of 0. We will then know the anomalous magnetic moment of the um, of the electron to order e squared. OK? Is everyone happy with this? Because we're going to go into an orgy of Feynman computations. They're going to cover the board several times over. But I mean, this is strong stuff. Huh? This is a Nobel Prize class computation. So this is the computation uh, Roy was telling me at lunch that at the New York meeting, at that time, the phys phys community of physicists were so small, they had the New York meeting in classrooms at Columbia University <laughs> in, uh, in uh, 1948. Yes? In 1948, Julian Schwinger got a standing ovation for the computation. <laughs> that is not to be considered, that's not to be considered as a hint. <laughs> he did it for the first time. I'm doing it for around the 700th time. <laughs> Actually, the fourth time within the past 24 hours <laughs> until I finally, <laughs> finally got it to come out right. I didn't have my reference books at home, so I was just <laughs> struggling away getting my signs right. <laughs> now, so our task is to compute f2 of 0 to order e cubed. I really made an incredible sequence of dumb mistakes. And it's got later and later at night. And I got hastier and hastier and sleepier and sleepier. I made more and more of them. Dreadful. The compute. Well, let's remember the process to which we are attempting to compute the radiative. To attempting to compute the radiative corrections just so we'll get our overall signs right. The process to lowest order is this. 
And to lowest order, the thing we get from this is E u bar prime gamma mu u. That just tells us what factors we have to divide out and label us to get things straight. <clears throat> to next order, order e squared, there are four graphs, e cubed, I should say. There'll be an e squared factored out of the e over 2m in front of the moment. There's this graph. <coughs> Coming with it, there is the photon wave function renormalization counterterm, <coughs> which I compute must compute to second order only, so I'll have a graph of order E cubed total. This means counterterm, this means computed to second order in E. There is this graph. And there is the charge renormalization counterterm, again indicated with a big X, and which also must be computed now, I guess, to third order. D. Now, our first observation is that although we went through all that work with renormalization theory, in fact, no renorm we never have to compute a counterterm for this process. Because A, B, and D only contribute all proportional to U bar prime gamma mu U. It's obvious. There's just a gamma mu sticking here. No matter what happens upstairs, that's not going to change. And the counter term is being a, of the same form as the original coupling, also proportional to gamma mu. Therefore, we all need only worry about graph C, but that will give us troubles enough. <laughs> Notice that graph C, at least, therefore, F2 of 0 should come out to being a finite answer without, or indeed, F2 of k squared should come out being a finite answer without any worries about counter terms or subtractions. Yes, sir? Can you say why you more those two graphs? Because I'm only computing F2 of 0, and they only contribute to F1. Remember the decomposition. Remember the decomposition. F1 times this plus e over 2m i sigma mu nu k nu times F2. If I were computing F1, I would certainly have to worry about each and every one of them. But I'm not computing F1, and therefore I shall not worry about any of them. Yes, sir? No, because the electrons are in mass shell. And therefore, any correction to the external legs is simply canceled out by the counter terms, and therefore we don't bother to write either of them down. For an on-mass shell, shell particle, electrons of on-mass shell particles, there is no need to put radiative computations, corrections on the external legs. The condition that defines the counter terms say they cancel. <coughs> Now, we go on. Therefore, I will write graph C in large so I can label the momentum. label this momentum p and this p prime as conventional. I will label this k going around the loop in a mathematically positive sense. So this is p plus, uh, not k, sorry, q. This is p plus q, and this is going to give off q and become p prime. So this is p prime plus q, a nice symmetric way of labeling the internal momenta. <clears throat> Graph, the uh, relevant part of F mu, ignoring these things, is firstly u bar prime, of course. Um, now, the first thing that happens is that I have a um, 
a gamma matrix as I go this way. I should say the last thing that happens. I'll call it gamma lambda. I then have a phot an electron propagator, p prime slash plus q prime plus q slash plus m over p plus q squared, p prime plus q squared minus m squared times an i. Then I have a uh, gamma e gamma mu with no i's because I factored all of those out, all of those i's and all of those photon propagators at that vertex, so this thing will just be E gamma mu. Then I have P slash plus Q slash plus M times i. Over P plus Q squared minus M squared. Then I have the other gamma matrix associated to the photon. And if I use Feynman gauge propagators, so the numerator of the propagator is g mu nu, that just means I sum this index over here with this index over here. Then I have the photon propagator minus i over q squared. And then finally, I have minus i e squared coming from the two vertices. <coughs> and I have, of course, Thank you. Integral, whoops, a u and an integral d4q over 2 pi to the fourth. Does everyone agree with every sign and factor in this expression? Yes, sir. In the middle, you have a g that you define on the outside of the fourth. No, this is f mu. Then I'll multiply by m over 2e once I extract out the sigma mu nu part. But f, f is order e cubed, right? Yeah, that's order e cubed. Right. And then I'll divide by 2m over e after I get the sigma, or multiply yeah. by 2m over e after I get the sigma mu nu part. This is f mu as defined before. And of course, for purists, I should say plus dot dot dot, meaning all those terms we've already discarded because they're proportional to gamma mu <laughs> and not going to be of interest to us ultimately. <clears throat> now, I gather up all, let's see, I've got a minus sign here, a minus sign here, that's an i. I've got two i's, so that's minus i e cubed, e cubed, integral d4 cubed over 2 pi to the fourth a numerator over a denominator. I will now systematically simplify, one after another, the numerator and the denominator. The first step is a standard one we've done in many calculations before. I will take the p prime slash and bring it anti-commute it with the gamma. It will then become a factor of m with a minus sign and cancel this m up here. Thus, I will be left, of course, with the anti-commutator 2p lambda. So numerator equals u bar prime 2p lambda, the leftover anti-commutator, the p prime slash acting on the thing is dead, plus gamma lambda q slash gamma mu p prime, thank you, Doing the same thing on the other side, q slash gamma upper lambda plus 2p lambda. U. OK, there's no profit. It turns out I tried it that way. There's no profit in bringing the q slashes through at this stage, so I'll just keep them in the middle for the moment. Of course, we can now do a lot of summations on lambda. This equals u bar prime, summing this with this, 4 p dot p prime, gamma mu, u. This term, of course, we dropped 
because it is proportional to gamma mu, a procedure we will follow systematically throughout. And we are only interested in the coefficient of sigma mu nu. <laughs> The remaining terms are unfortunately not so transparent, and I have to write them out. U bar prime gamma mu q slash 2 in front, q slash p prime slash u plus 2 u bar prime p slash q slash gamma mu u plus u bar prime q slash gamma mu, whoops, sorry, 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 gamma lambda q slash gamma mu q slash gamma lambda u. What did I do wrong? Okay, the cross term this with this, this with this. Okay, now that's just going to sit there for a while as I turn to the denominator. It's going to be a tedious computation, but I promise to have it done by the end of the hour. Okay, is this so far? This is straightforward stuff. The denominator is rather simple, in fact. Let's see. I can erase the trailing part of this. I certainly want this, and I certainly want this expression for the numerator. The denominator is simplified by the following thing. p plus q squared minus m squared the first term here is p squared, which cancels m squared, since p squared equals m squared. So I'm just left with 2q dot p plus q squared. Secondly, I have the marvelous denominator combining formula that tells me 1 over abc is 2 integral over a certain range, which I will specify in a moment, is um, 1 over ax plus by plus c, 1 minus x minus y, quantity cubed. That was one of the Feynman formulas, which we discussed in detail when we were doing scalar theories. The range of integration is x and y both greater than 0, x plus y less than or equal to 1, or a triangle. So I'll just write it for shorthand as integral over that triangle in x, y space. It is thus fairly easy to combine the denominators. Here they are. p squared. Well, I've erased it. I'm sorry. It was a q squared, as you recall. P, q squared gets the coefficient of x, y, and 1 minus x minus y. So it ends up with a coefficient 1. p dot q, or p, pri p prime dot q, ends up with a coefficient of x. p dot q ends up with a coefficient of y. And m squared ends up with a coefficient. m squared hasn't entered. m squared hasn't entered. It's zero. Cubed. It is now fairly easy to do this integral by making the famous shift. p plus qx plus, sorry, dead wrong. Right again. Q plus P prime X plus PY equals Q prime, or equivalently, Q prime equals Q minus PX minus P, P prime X minus PY. We thus complete the square in the denominator. 
Uh, yes, you're right. Thank you. I just wrote this. Thank you. Uh, you're keeping me honest. Good. First denominator equals integral over the triangle dx dy. And someone should have caught me. Of course, that's the inverse of the denominator if I write it as n over d. <laughs> The inverse of the denominator equals 2 over the triangle, dx dy. 1 over q prime squared minus p squared, which is m squared, times x squared, minus p prime squared, which is m squared times y squared, minus 2p dot p prime times xy whole quantity cubed. <coughs> Any questions? I've just subtracted p prime x minus plus p y squared. Now, we can simplify this even further for our purposes. p minus p prime squared equals k squared. Therefore, 2m squared minus 2p dot p prime equals k squared. Now, we are not interested in terms of order k squared. We're very much interested in terms of order k because they'll mark the F2 form factor. Terms of order k squared are just going to give us corrections to F2 as we k squared moves away from 0. Therefore, up to terms of order k squared, which we don't give a damn about, we have a very simple expression for the denominator. Minus m squared x plus y squared cubed plus order k squared. And we're not concerned about order k squared. We're only going to order k. Sigma mu nu k slash times f2 of 0. Okay, that completes the simplification of the denominator. Are there any questions? It's a sequence of steps unrivaled for their tedium, but remember, it may seem dull to now, that's because standards of Shrama have changed. 30 years ago, it got a standing ovation. Now, <laughs> did it in a different way also. <laughs> any question? It's a very pedestrian computation, but there's going to be at least one time in this course when I go through a long pedestrian computation, and this is it. Now, <laughs> so we've simplified the denominator. Now, back to the numerator. numerator, I must substitute for q this expression. The terms that I will obtain terms that are linear in q and of course they have q prime and of course they vanish because the integration denominator is now an even function of q prime. I will also obtain terms that involve no powers of q prime and terms that are quadratic in q prime. <laughs> and I will write those down. I had better write them down with my piece of paper in front of me. So far, I've gone with no problems. <coughs> okay. Firstly, I will write down the terms that involve no powers of Q prime. That means that whenever I see a Q down here, I simply replace it with a P prime X plus minus P prime X plus P Y equals <laughs> minus sign 2 u bar prime p prime oh, sorry off to the right right start gamma mu that's this term right over here p prime x plus p y p prime slash U. 
That's the first term. And we observe that this term we can drop because p prime slash p prime slash is m squared and proportional to gamma mu. Second term, minus 2 u bar prime, same thing in the other order, p slash p prime slash x plus p slash y gamma mu u. By the same token, we can drop this term. Going to 0 means just proportional to gamma mu. Third term, coming from here, u bar prime gamma lower lambda p prime slash x plus p slash y gamma mu p prime slash x plus p slash y gamma lambda u. Fourth term, from this term we also get a term quadratic in q prime. It's going to simplify drastically in a moment. This is its most horrendous form. <laughs> but there it is. Straightforward numerical substitution, dropping terms linear in q prime. Any questions? Now, I will begin by looking at what is, a pro what is the most awful appearing term. I make the following observation. Integral d4q, a function of q squared, times q rho, q sigma, must be, because the integration is completely Lorentz invariant, proportional to g rho sigma. In fact, the constant of proportionality, as you see, as soon as I write down the formula, the one quarter is checked by taking the trace of both sides and observing that that makes them equal. <laughs> uh, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Now, thus, the last term Oh, sorry. That's the first identity I'll use. The second identity I'll use is this. Gamma mu, gamma lambda, gamma lambda, gamma mu, gamma lambda is minus 2 gamma mu. I can't remember if this was one of the um, homework problems I gave you last semester. It wasn't. But it's very easy to check because for any given gamma mu, uh, one of the gamma lambdas commutes and three of them anti-commute, so you end up with one plus sign and three minus signs, which is known as minus two. <laughs> That's also in the back of you-know-where. Yes, it's also in the, well, well, actually the answer to this problem is in the back of you-know-where. If I, hmm. no, it's in the appendix. It's in the gamma matrix appendix. My disaster is that someone borrowed my copy of volume one and didn't return it. So I, as for this part, I just have to work with the appendix of volume two. Anyway, <coughs> plugging in these two facts, I see that u bar prime gamma lambda q prime slash gamma mu q prime slash gamma lambda u is equivalent in this integral. I just do the thing twice. This is, a, this is a two sum of two gamma matrices. A sum of two gamma matrices cancels the one quarter with the two twos. I get q squared gamma mu, which I send to 0, because that's completely f1 again. So this term is also negligible. We have now reached an important point, because no, I have a math. Because uh, I am, we have now eliminated the q squared, all the q squared dependent terms. I shouldn't have said q squared. I should have said q prime squared. You've eliminated all the q prime squared terms from the numerator. And therefore, the integral is manifestly convergent, being integral d4 q prime over q prime to the 6. Until this stage, there was a q prime squared floating around in the numerator, and there was a possibility of a logarithmic divergence, which would not only have, which would have given me the wrong anomalous magnetic moment in a very drastic way, to wit, a divergent one. 
That possibility has now been eliminated. The answer I may obtain may be right or it may be wrong, but it will certainly be finite. <laughs> yes? Yeah, of course, we've checked that all those renormalization theorems I proved worked out for the simple graph. Well, they have divergent parts with finite parts underneath them, so to speak, if I expand the denominator in a power <coughs> series. It's better to do it this way. That's cautious. <laughs> okay, maybe there's a finite residual piece when it's... I was going to say, for instance, that last part of the Hmm? That's right, but no one would have swallowed it. <laughs> Better to go through this way and then check the renormalization works out as it should be. Okay. We are still left with these god awful terms. I don't want to destroy the denominator. I'd better write down here that F mu is minus i e cubed. That's what I have there, isn't it? Yeah. Integral d4 cubed prime over 2 pi to the fourth and over d. So I won't lose that. I've got d preserved above, and now I can erase this. term can be gotten down from five gamma matrices to three gamma matrices with the aid of a little wonder identity, which I will state without proof. It's proved along the same lines. If, all, if we consider A, B, and C to be unit vectors, so these are individual gamma matrices sandwiched in the middle, I'll sketch the proof. If they're all three gamma matrices are the same, it's the previous identity. If two of them are the same and one of them is different, it is also the previous identity. And I'd leave it to you to prove it when they're all three different, because the case we're after here is where two of them are the same and one of them is <laughs> No. Thus. No, at this stage it was five in the morning, so I'd better look very carefully <laughs> at my notes. Yes. Um, oops, what did I do? What did I do? Ah, yes. I seem to have a minus sign. <laughs> <laughs> we go. Just a minute. Minus two. Oh dear, 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 dear. Dear, 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 dear. Well, let's just play along and see if it cancels. Otherwise, this lecture will end with me falling on the floor. For <laughs> Nobody caught me in any errors up to now. No, it's just I made a minus sign. I dropped it when I transferred. Hmm. Oh, 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 I see. I did something more. Eight, nine. What the devil did I do at this stage? Oh, oh, I see. I see. I went a little... What the devil does that mean? <laughs> Ah, 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 I remember what I did. <laughs> Rescue. <laughs> yeah, don't make error. Now, in writing down the first term, I can commute this anti-commute, uh, this p slash with the gamma mu. When I do that, I'll get an, um, sorry, that's not the way I want to do it. I can anti-commute the p slash with the p prime slash. The term I get from the anti-commutator will be m again. OK, the term I will get from the, uh, sorry, the anti-commuted term will be m again. The anti-commutator will be p dot p prime times gamma mu, which again, I can drop. <laughs> That's the step I made. <laughs> n, <laughs> u bar prime. OK, there's a big 2 in front. Everything will get a 2, so I'll put that out there. u bar prime. Let's write it this way. 
There's a gamma mu sitting here. I've anti-commuted, so I get an M. I have an, uh, a, a uh, Y. I have a P prime slash. Which term is that? This one here. I've anti-commuted those two things and dropped the anti-commutator. Same thing in the second term. From P slash acting on U. <laughs> the same thing in the other term, P slash M X gamma mu. Finally, the last term, I use my little wonder identity up here. So that gives me a minus sign. And I have, changing the order doesn't do a damn thing, P prime slash X plus P slash Y. Gamma mu, still in the middle. P prime slash X plus P slash Y. And finally, a U. Now, I will now use the fact that I've got a lot of things on the wrong side, and I won't bother to commute them. I'll use the fact that P prime equals P plus K, P equals P prime minus K. To turn the P primes over on the right into P's, and the P's on the, uh, on the left into P primes, leaving me with K's still floating around the right or left. But that's fine, as you'll see. So, 2 U bar prime. <coughs> when I make this a P, I get an M, and it's proportional to gamma mu, so I drop it again. <laughs> so I've got gamma mu, it's pushing the end. I'm beginning to see the right answer materializing. MXK slash minus MY, thank you, minus K slash MX gamma mu, because P, sl P slash is P prime slash minus K. Those are the first two terms, looking good. Um, the last term, I'll get by making the trick, and I'll have MX minus Y gamma mu MX minus Y, which is gamma mu, and I drop. Pick up a term linear in K slash from here. So I get minus K slash X from here, gamma mu M X plus Y from here, zeroth order in K slash, going the other way plus y gamma mu m x plus y k slash u plus order k squared, which I don't care about, k slash k slash. <laughs> now, we are now in a stage. Everyone follow this. It's going to be just a two or three minutes until I get to the end. Everyone follow this? It's okay? It's straightforward? Well, you've enjoyed watching me struggle and sweat. <laughs> now, we can now simplify things in one fell swoop by making the following observation. Integral dx dy over the triangle is symmetric under the interchange of x and y. <laughs> the denominator is symmetric under the interchange of x and y. This factor here is symmetric under the interchange of x and y. Therefore, to symmetrize the integral, we might as well symmetrize the integrand since we're integrating over a symmetric region. So we can uniformly replace either x and y by x plus y over 2. That's just adding the integrand at x to the integrand at y. <laughs> okay, here and here and here. Thus, <laughs> numerator equals the 2 disappears because of the substitution I have made. U bar prime 
this factor is now the same as this. X plus Y. They're both X plus Y. Gamma mu K slash at last. That is the first two terms. And the last term, this one and this one, again, it becomes a denominator minus x plus y squared. I left out my factors of m, didn't I? m gamma mu k slash u. Now you may remember from the beginning of this lecture when you made the foolish decision to enter this room that gamma mu k slash equals minus 2i sigma mu nu k nu. Thus, we finally have the expression for f2 of 0, the coefficient of sigma mu nu k nu. Isn't it nice how everything assembled to give us the right answer? <laughs> we have to multiply. This is f mu, which we're computing, remember. So we have to multiply by m, uh, sorry, by 2m over e to get f2 of 0, because it's e over 2m, f2 of 0. So at last, we're done with spinner algebra. F2 of 0 is 2m over e, because I defined the coefficient to be e over 2m, minus i e cubed, because that was there at the very beginning uh, over here. The factor from the numerator, well, integral d4q over 2 pi fourth, 1 over q squared minus m squared x plus y squared cubed 2. Sorry, that was the denominator with a 2 integral dx dy integrated over the triangle. And now from up here, I have m out in front minus 2i and x plus y minus x plus y squared. Okay, that's the integral we're going to do in three minutes because we got an integral table. I distributed it last semester that tells you how to do all known integrals of this form. Any questions? Any questions? Did I make a mistake? No. Okay. And then I did indeed. It's not minus 2i, it's minus 2. It's i sigma mu nu k nu. OK? All done? Everyone happy? Good. OK. Our integral table tells us, at least it told me, when I, I couldn't find my own copy, so I rederived it. So I hope I did it right. Here we are at the end of this page. integral d4q over 2 pi fourth 1 over q squared minus a squared cubed. It has an i in it, of course, coming from the Euclidean rotation. It is, in fact, minus i over 32 pi squared a squared. The a squared is obvious from the dimensional analysis. I'm not going to rederive the 32 pi squared for you. I did it last semester. Someone give me a match, please. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Now, it's a simple joke, but it never ceases to amuse you. <laughs> Wait until Glashow comes through the door and hits me over the head with an inflated pig bladder. <laughs> Now, we have, <laughs> we, let's add up all our factors. I have a minus i here, a minus i here, and a minus sign here. So that's plus 1. I don't have to add that up. I have a 2 here, a 2 here, and a 2 here. That's an 8, which comes with the 32. 
to give me 1 over 4 pi squared. I have an m here, an m here, and an m squared coming from the denominator. a squared is x minus y, x plus y squared times m squared. So I have no m, which is a good thing because it would be dumb to go this far and make a dimension error. <laughs> I have e cubed in the e, so that gives me e squared. I'm left with the integral over the triangle, which I'll now write out explicitly, dx from 0 to 1, dy from 0 to 1 minus x. x minus y, x plus y over x plus y squared, which is 1 over x plus y, minus x plus y squared over x plus y squared, which is 1. I will now do the y integral. Is uh, everyone happy? That's a logarithmic integral. The upper integral gives me a logarithm of x plus 1 minus x, otherwise known as log 1 or 0. The lower bound gives me minus log x. The second term gives me minus 1 minus x. Integrate dx. Integral dx from 0 to 1, which I will now do. Um, the integral of um, log x is x log x, my, log x plus 1 is no, well known to be the derivative of x log x. e squared over 4 pi squared. Therefore, I have minus x log x plus x squared over 2 evaluated between 0 and 1. X log x vanishes at both the upper and lower bounds. X squared over 2 evaluated between 0 and 1 is 1 half. So I obtain e squared over 8 pi squared. Thus, the uh, magnetic moment of the electron is given by mu equals E over M times 1 plus F2 of 0, or to the order in which we are working, E over M 1 plus uh, 1 over 2 pi e squared over 4 pi. Remember, we're working in rationalized units, so it's e squared over 4 pi that appears in the Coulomb's law and is what is normally called the fine structure constant. This is the thing that's approximately 1 over 137. Now, next lecture I will discuss um, how this fits with experiment. I couldn't get the numbers last night. I will discuss how it fits with experiment. The answer is, of course, very well, which is the reason this course is on the curriculum. <laughs> Possibly the only reason this course is on the curriculum. <laughs> and make a few brief remarks about higher order corrections and then talk about some other things. <laughs>